Welcome to episode two of Playing with Unicorns. Today we're going to cover how to build a minimum viable product or MVP for 20,000 or less. After last week's session of fundraising, I considered whether or not this week we should do a follow-up session on how venture capitalists evaluate startups. But figured at the end of the day, you need a product in order for it to be evaluated, so we should start with this. So let's get going. So the most common fallacy that entrepreneurs have is that they need hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in order to launch the product. In fact, the most common misconstrued email I get on LinkedIn is someone contacting me and saying, okay, if only you gave me these millions of dollars, then this idea would revolutionize the world. But that's actually, that's actually not the way the venture capital world works or the expectation that you have. And the reality is you can build frankly, almost every or any idea you have for less than 50K, probably for less than 20K. Now, there are a number of ways to do this, and I will cover them shortly. So I'll start by giving a theoretical framework of ideas of things you should do and not do in order to build successfully for a, on a limited budget. Then I'll give a very specific example of an idea that I helped build or at least considered building for the daughter of a friend of mine and uh, finalize this with answering questions that you, the audience may have. Now, before I get started, there's one obvious way you can get going, which is of course get a technical co-founder. And uh, one way for that not to cost anything, of course, is to compensate that co-founder in equity. And I can do a separate session if it's of interest on how much equity different key stakeholders should have in the early stage, how much dilution you should accept, et cetera. The, the thing you need to consider, keep in mind though, if you ever come to someone with equity instead of cash, is everyone should be on a vesting schedule. No one should get their stock no matter what, because you never know. Perhaps they're not going to be delivering. Perhaps they're, they're going to be leaving. Now, a vesting schedule means that the stock you give them is granted over time. The prototypical structure for a vesting schedule in, in a startup is spread over four years with a one-year cliff. So if you gave someone 4%, for instance, and I'm not saying that's the right amount, just to make the math easy, they would get, they'd be eligible, or they'd get one full percent after one year of being the company. Until then, they really get nothing, they're just vesting little by little. After one year and one day, they get their full 1%, which is 25% of the allocation. And after that, they'd be earning on a monthly basis, I guess one thirty-six of their allocation every month. And after four years, they'd get the full allocation that you've granted them. You can, of course, grant new allocations in the future if you think that it's warranted and worthwhile. Now, something to note is as a founder, your own shares are also going to be in a vesting schedule. So when venture capitalists invest in your company, if you're fully vested ahead of time, they will revest you. Probably if you've been there for a year, they'll already give you um, one quarter of your allocation, and then the rest will go in investing schedule, probably in a, on a similar format of one year cliff and then four year vesting overall, uh, depending on how long you've been in the company before then. And the reason that this happens, and the reason it makes sense is should you leave, they need the equity to compensate a new team to come in to replace you. And that's true, frankly, of everyone who's there. Now, this little aside, this video is really more about if you don't have a technical co-founder, if you don't have your own technical skills, how do you go about in building a minimum viable product to verify that your idea is really good, that you do have product market fit for very little money? So a few general do's and don'ts that I want to share first. So first, don't hire a large development shop. So there are amazing development shops out there. You know, Accenture falls in the category, but they were probably on the really high end, but others like Globant. Any type of change requests that you do with people like that um, would, 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 would require, I guess, every change you would want to do would require a change order form. And each change order form um, would actually add delays. And so it's not appropriate for iterating very rapidly when you're in early stage. Not to mention that on general or in general, their costs are really high. Uh, number two, learn a code. So don't learn a code. 
you can actually go and take classes and after eight weeks you might be somewhat proficient in Python or, or PHP or whatever, but frankly there's a lot of talent out there and there are a lot of alternatives and it's probably not the best use of your time. You're after all the visionary, the one designing the, the product, trying to figure out how to make it work. Coding is really not something you should, uh, you should do. It might be useful for you to understand how it works so you can manage teams better, but frankly you should not be building your own MVP, at least through traditional coding. And last, and maybe probably most importantly, is don't start building immediately. Once you have an idea that you think is good, you feel that you need to immediately get going, etc. But if you do that, you're gonna make you're gonna forget a lot of issues, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna forget a lot of like the flows or and you're not gonna think of all the scenarios. And so instead, spend a lot more time thinking through the user flow. Exactly what what, what it will a user do every step of the way, and I really mean every step of the way, like from uh, signing up to recovering the password to, I mean, really design the flow and every, every single button or action on every page needs to be thought through. And if you do that, you'll save a lot of time and once you want to go and get it developed, you're going to have specifications that are much easier to use and you're going to be able to get designs that are actually in line with everything that you, that, that you had in mind. And when I think through, think through the user flow, by the way, I don't just mean the end user flow, I also mean your administrator flow as you're managing the website, because most likely you want to see the statistics. Most likely you want to be able to manage the, the database, answer questions from customers, or, or, or frankly even do curation if you need to ban users who are misbehaving. You should definitely use low-code or no-code solutions. For instance, if you're building an e-commerce site, there's no reason not to use Shopify in, in, in 2020. It'll be a lot easier uh, to, to get going, and this is, again, not where you should be allocating your resources. And that's true, frankly, of a lot of the underlying operations that a site can have, depending on what it does, and, and you can find solutions that allow you to build a site very easily. And maybe, perhaps most importantly, really think through this is meant to be a minimum viable product. So just think through what the core functionality is and build that. Don't build, you don't need all the bells and whistles, you just need to test the core value proposition and really nothing else. And that means thinking through what you really want in this V1 versus what you want in, 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 in future versions um, rather than trying to go and launch with all the bells and whistles because if it turns out that your idea didn't work, you spend a lot of money doing a lot of things for no reason. And by the way, most features that you test don't really move the needle all that much. So really think through what the core value proposition is. And so this is a, a quote attributed to Voltaire, but uh, that definitely resonates today. It's the perfect is the enemy of the good, or the best is the enemy of the good. Uh, good enough is, is, uh, is more than good enough. And I think it's Paul Graham or me, Saul Altman, who said, you should be ashamed of the first product you put out there. And that's definitely true. Just get the product out there. If it resonates, you'll, you'll figure it out immediately. And if it doesn't resonate, you know, you'll learn whether you need to move on or to iterate. So now let's go and give a concrete example of an idea that I try to help build um, for the daughter of a friend of mine. So I'll start with what the idea was. Um, she, she thought that it might make sense to create a, a, a golf application where golfers would find people to play with. That were, and so it needed to cover their handicap, so they were at the more or less the same level. Uh, it needed to cover the club they were members of, or the region, they, the region they could play in, and their availability. And so she had that idea, she thought she validated, and so it was like, okay, what do we do now? So the first thing we did from a evaluating product perspective is actually look at competitive products. Now, part of the reason she liked the idea was there, were, there was no one really doing this in the US and she thought it might make sense. But looking around the world, actually there were a number of applications doing more or less the same thing. So Dimples was an, an example in Southeast Asia that had some of the features that allowed you to set the times at which you were available or maybe book a time and have people join your game as a means of sharing fees and finding people to play with. Not exactly what she did in mind because it didn't really match you with other players, uh, but still reasonably interesting. Uh, most of the other sites that, that were 
um, that, that were out there were really golf sites to pick your tee time. So it was more like the open table of the category rather than a matching engine. And so still interesting to know it's there, um, perhaps as a functionality to add in the future, but probably not all that relevant. So the next thing you do is think through, okay, are there sites that, are, that have similar features maybe in other verticals? And clearly, if you're thinking of matching players with each other, dating sites come to mind, right? Obviously, in Bumble and Tinder, you're trying to find people, match people to have dates. Now, of course, the criteria are different, but looking at the flows, looking at how they sign up users, looking at how they make them validate their profiles, looking at how they do the matching and the chatting is actually interesting because something that can be replicated, of course, using different criteria for this specific example. And then around the world, we saw examples like Playtomic, which is a Spanish site allowing Padel players, which is a form, um, I guess, contemporary or future version of tennis, uh, to find players with each other, which was also really interesting. So once you've analyzed the flows of your competitors uh, and co people in coin joint categories, I think it's useful to actually write down everything you need your minimum viable product to do. And so in this case, you need onboarding, you need analytics, you need notifications to users that maybe someone wants to talk to them or play with them. You need to authenticate the users. You need to have access to the chat history. And then you need a discovery feature. And the discovery feature that we decided to start with are players. So looking at their players, finding them next to you, and being able to talk to them. And you see all the dependencies. So if you have, you're have you discovering player, you need their profile. You need their availability. You need their location. You need to be able to talk to them. Now, for phase two, we decided maybe, and we don't need it today because in a way it's offered in the other, in the other apps, is a database of the clubs and perhaps the ability to book in these clubs. But not really needed because the, the idea here was can we find players at, at, at our level with our availability in our region? And of course you need to be able to update the availability. Um, so once we define this feature set, we're like, okay, let's do, um, let's hand draw, um, test, um, the, the entire flow. And so this is, uh, my, and I apologize for my horrible handwriting, this is me starting with like, okay, this is the first page of an app. This is an app, and we're gonna have a logo. Uh, we're gonna have a description of the product, and then we're gonna have a sign in, sign up, or, or login page. Then from there, we're going to go and create an account. Let's say in this case, we're not using Facebook, so you're putting your email, you're putting your password, you're putting your date of birth, and your gender, and your name, and then you're logging in. And I decided it didn't make sense at this point, by the way, to fill in a full profile, and we'd do that later, copying some of the flows and gamification that I saw in some of the other apps. And so did this entire, this, these hand-drawn mock-ups for, frankly, the entire site. But again, I figured that if I sent this to a designer or if I sent this to a developer, it would actually be more complicated for them to understand because this may be clear to me because I've iterated on it a lot. It might not be clear to them. And so it actually makes sense to create kind of an interactive mock-up for them, for them to see how it works. So a few more slides showing everything else. And once you're logged in, you know, finding players, filling the profile if it's not there, chatting with them, et cetera. So I literally laid out on, 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 on pages and depending on sometimes one, one page uh, for a full mock-up, sometimes you know, multiple flows with arrows between every one of the different points, uh, the entire site. Then I used this product called Balsamic to create an interactive design that made it way more understandable. Now again, there's absolutely no design involved in this. It's more, what do the flows look like? Uh, in order to then later get someone to build a design so then I can send it to get it spec'd out. So let me give you a demonstration, a presentation of how it played out here. So, this is the kind of a concept that I had for the homepage, but again, the design doesn't matter here, where you sign up for free, you enter your email address, you choose your password, you enter your birthday, you select your gender, and you're done. Then you verify your email, and once you've verified your email, you can log in. But right now, you don't really have a profile. So we, there are multiple ways that I was suggesting people create their profile, but here it was like, use your current location, Again, allowing, it, allowing the app to discover it. And all these were things you would see in a normal app. And then again, they were replicated in it. And I've made sure that I didn't forget a single step in the process um, such that the specs would be really in line with what was needed. Then once it discovered where I was, I started filling my profile, adding photo, adding basic availability, my default club, and there, here I was. 
and people could see, I could see my own profile where, where um, you could see who, who I am, in this case, you know, a few jokes, what I do, what my handicap is, and, and where I'm located. Now I'm ready to find players. So I started looking for players around me. Of course, this is completely ripped off from Tinder, but it doesn't matter. And ooh, I see that Sam is available in the neighborhood. And um, he seems to be more or less at the same level I'm at. So I want to chat with them and I'm offering and I'm offering to play with them. And that gives you a sense of the full functionality. And there are other way things you could do in terms of organizing a game or finding a game if any are available. So this gives you a sense. So now this entire flow, it's pretty clear for most people to understand how this works. And now I, I need a real design. So let's get back to the next step of the process once you have uh, the entire flow created. Um, so then I thought through, okay, what type of design do I have in mind? What do I want it to look like from a color palette, from, uh, from color codes, et cetera? And understanding that we as probably conceptualizers of ideas and we're not designers. Um, but there are a few things that I think I liked and I liked sharing. So I said, you know, I read the like rounded buttons. What do you see on Spotify and Tinder? I uh, wanted something super simple and clear, and when it came to different pages, things that I think we could take, take inspiration from. So Instagram, Bumble, et cetera. So I gave those ideas, so I wrote the concepts for what I was looking for from a, from, an, from a design perspective without actually telling them what I wanted because I told them, look, at the end of the day, I'm not a designer, I don't know what's possible, uh, make proposals. Which takes us to the next stage, which is uh, going to, in this case, Upwork, and asking people to come up with uh, proposals. So actually, once you've done all this work ahead of time, and this is just for the design, and we're gonna do the same thing later for, for the technical side, it's a lot easier because you, you go to the, the designers and the graphic artists and you say, okay, this is all the pages I need mocked up. Um, this is what I have in mind from a design perspective, but make proposals. So created the job posts and then let people join in. And all of a sudden we had literally dozens um, of people apply. And the prices were kind of all over the place. It's like, you can see $10 an hour to $50 an hour. But what's probably good to keep in mind is you should spend 1,500 to 2,500 on the design. I wouldn't spend more than that. And as people apply, look through their portfolio. Frankly, many of them will do a little bit of work, like send you a few images before you even hire them to show what they have in mind and see if it's in line. But going in their portfolio is usually a good idea to see if their design aesthetic is in line with, with, with yours. And so in this case, I found two that I really liked, ended up hiring one to go and build a design. Which takes me to the next page of how do you work with designers? And frankly, how do I work with developers in general? And you know, they send you mock-ups, but perhaps you wanna make changes and put ideas, et cetera. And so you need to be editing them and putting comments on them. Now, most people, most designers work in Photoshop. The thing is Photoshop is expensive, it's complicated to use. It's frankly not appropriate for most of us who are not graphic designers to use. And so the way I work with uh, the programmers I work with and the way I work with the designers I work with is with this little cool tool called Awesome Screenshot. It's a little plugin that's in uh, Chrome um, that I use to make comments. So I'll give you an example of how, let's say I, I'm gonna go to the dev version of my blog. Uh, so this is the dev version of my blog. It's not, this is not the version that's currently live. And let's say I have comments here. So I would click on that little awesome screenshot. I could decide if I wanna capture the visible part of the full page or a selected area. Here, let's say I'll just select the visible part. And if I wanted to make comments, uh, let it work a little bit. And if I want to make comments, it's super easy. I, usually, I, the way I work is I would like surround in red like this area and say, oh, and then I put like text like uh, vertically and horizontally align this. Um, or maybe I want to, um, you know, here, remove the title, put a big arrow. And so this is a very good way to iterate because you say this, you send it to them, and it, especially if you have them on Zoom or Skype or Slack, you can iterate very quickly um, with graphic designers in terms of making sure you get exactly what you have in mind. Again, as I said, it needs to be just good enough. It doesn't need to be perfect, so I wouldn't allocate too much time to make it get pixel perfect for a minimum and viable product. 
but it's a good way to get what you want. So back here. So I've, we've done that, let's say, and now we have a version that we're happy with. So now that we have a design we're happy with, let's, let's, get, the, let's get a technical version out, let's get a technical specification out, and let's get developers to propose to build this for us. So the next thing to do is really write, I guess what I call a software technical specification document, which covers really what we're doing, <clears throat> what, the scope of the, what the scope of the project is, and who are going to be the users and walk people through the user stories. So usually I, uh, for the user stories on the user and user side, it's going to be rather easy because I'm going to attach to the entire flow and they're going to see what the user sees. But you need to think through part of the specifications. We also want an administrator, uh, someone who can actually do curation and delete profiles, approve profiles, maybe edit the database, et cetera. So you need to think through all the specifications. And also, what is it that we want to be developing? You don't necessarily need to launch with a website and an Android version and an iOS version. And so here, I decided the website would be a simple marketing landing page. We wanted an iOS version, perhaps a, an Android version. And again, went to, um, went to Upwork to see who would come. Um, and we got a lot of proposals. And many of them ended up more in this price range. So we could get the iOS app and a design and pretty much everything we needed for about $13,900. And for another $4,500, we can get an Android app, should it make sense or be warranted. But frankly, to make sure that your idea works, you don't even need to spend that amount of money. And so in this case, frankly, for less than $15,000, we could get a fully viable, minimum viable product with everything from back office tools, the iOS app, a marketing landing page, and all the tools we needed to actually manage the site and operate, and also to verify whether or not it was working, including tracking on the marketing where we tagged everything for Google, Facebook, et cetera, to make sure we could do a customer acquisition cost analysis relative to expected value of a subscription when we added and if we added a subscription, um, which was not part of V1, but we're thinking of adding it later, um, but it was marginally more expensive. But the first idea was, can we get people to want to use this before we monetize them? And this gives you a sense of how it works. And in this case, it came with the design from the same development shop that would, but it, these two can be separated. This gives you a sense of, um, frankly, a process that's replicable and can be used to building a minimum viable product for, frankly, almost any idea out there. I'm, almost everything can be built for really less than $50,000. And in this case, if it's less than $20,000, you still have a lot of cash left if you've raised 30 or 40 to do testing on marketing to make sure that the idea works. So I'll pause here and um, I'll switch over to questions. Okay, I'm not sure I see any questions today, um, which is totally fine. I can always answer uh, questions in the comments should they, uh, should they come later. And um, that's the case. I'll be ending the stream, in which case I look forward to seeing you next week where I'll be covering how venture capitalists evaluate startups. Um, see you in a week.